Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good evening and welcome. I would also like to extend a special welcome to Diane Andruk, the American Consul General, and to the Minister Councillor of the US Embassy, Reid Fendrick. My name is Anne Wertheim. I am the director of the John Adams Institute and honored to welcome our celebrated and long awaited guest, Mr. Scott Turow. Welcome, Mr. Turow. It has been nearly four years that we have been in contact with you, maybe chasing you, with the hope that you would choose one day to visit Amsterdam. Most of you, ladies and gentlemen, present here tonight are aware that the John Adams Institute organizes lectures and open mic discussions with American men and women of arts, letters, and science. Our two lecture series, American Literature Today and American Focus, have featured Nobel and Pulitzer Prize winners such as Sal Bello, Joseph Brodsky, Annie Proulx, and Gore Vidal, but also internationally renowned Name, renowned names such as John Kenneth Galbraith, Paul Volcker, and the architect Frank Gehry. In the past 11 years, we have built up a lecture program that can now claim a leading position on the European cultural scene, with a little exaggeration, of course. We are still dependent on gifts and donations, so we invite you all to become a donor and sign up at the information desk in the entrance hall. Before we begin, I would like to thank the Dutch publisher Luiting Seithoff, Penguin Books Netherlands, and book importer Van Ditmar for making tonight's event possible. This evening will be opened by the British writer and journalist Simon Cooper, who grew up in London and has become who grew, grew up in the Netherlands. Both. Both. Oh, okay. And has become an ardent admirer of Scott Turow's writing. At 9 o'clock, there will be a 15-minute, a really 15-minute intermission during which Mr. Turo will sign books seated at the podium. If not all of the books have been signed, then he will sign later after the event uh, is over. After the intermission, Simon Cooper will open the discussion with Scott Turo and take questions from the audience. There are two microphones in the aisles. But if you don't want to stand up and ask your question, you can hand in written questions at the book desk during the intermission. We will round up the evening at around 10 o'clock. Simon Cooper, the floor, floor is yours. Enjoy your evening. Welcome, everybody. You all know Scott Chiro, the author, the man who, it is often said, invented the legal thriller the thriller writer who writes what the Dutch like to call echte literatuur. And he's given us five novels so far. His first, Presumed Innocence, is the most famous, and his latest, Personal Injuries, which he's here to discuss tonight, is at least as good. What not everybody knows about Scott Chiro is that he's kept the day job. Throughout his career as a best-selling novelist, one of the best-selling novelists on the planet, he has continued to practice law. You may have read on the blurbs of his books that he's a partner in the Chicago law firm of Sonnenschein, Nath, and Rosenthal. I guess this is free advertising for them. But he really does practice law. He told me at dinner tonight that he does some legal work every day, perhaps even here in Amsterdam. One man knows very well how good Scott Chiro is as a lawyer, the man who spent 12 years in jail for a rape and murder he didn't commit before Mr. Chiro, after five years of unpaid work, got him out of jail. And it's by remaining a lawyer that Mr. Chiro has become a great novelist. In another life, when he was teaching creative writing at Stanford University, he says he was heavily influenced by realist novels. And in some way, there's no writer more realist than Mr. Chiro. He tells you what a law office looks like at four in the morning, what the characters in it are eating, how much they earn, and what their desks are made of, as well as what crimes they've committed. Mr. Chiro himself says that it's a sort of meat and potatoes realism. What Chicagoans know, which is that the real life is the only life, is an article of faith with me. When you read a Turo novel, you get the real thing, real law, real people. And that may sound trite, but it's a rare thing to find in a novel. For a start, there aren't that many novels that describe the world of work. Before he comes on to tell you about the fiction, let me tell you about his real life. Scott Chiro comes from Chicago, and some people say that Kindle County, the fictional setting of his novels, which is best described as Sodom and Gomorrah, but worse and with worse weather, faintly resembles Chicago. 
as a young man, he was well on the way to becoming a great novelist when he suddenly discovered the law. And he gave up his academic career at Stanford to attend Harvard Law School, probably the only novelist, only the only one I know of who's been to Harvard Law School. His only work of nonfiction, 1L, describes his terrifying first year at Harvard. And after law school, he returned after a year in Boston to Chicago, his hometown, to practice law. He began as an assistant US attorney, which is particularly relevant to us tonight, because it's from this period of his life that he's drawn his latest novel, Personal Injuries. While in the US Attorney's office, he worked in Operation Grey Lord, which was a six-year undercover investigation of Chicago's courts, astonishing for corrupt lawyers, judges, and policemen. Personal Injuries describes a very similar operation, no doubt difference in some respect. Um, all the characters in Mr. Churro's novels are very hardworking, and so is he. Because have you ever wondered how you might better use your journey to work? For eight years, riding the morning commuter train to the US Attorney's office, he worked on Presumed Innocent. And the book appeared in 1987, has sold millions of copies, and has also become a film starring Harrison Ford, so beat that. He then, after Presumed Innocent, wrote The Burden of Proof, pleading guilty, and the laws of our fathers, establishing himself uniquely, really, as a thriller writer who is as concerned with character and a sense of place as he is with plot. It's often said that Scott Chiro has done for the crime novel what John le Carre did for the spy novel. He peopled it with three-dimensional characters engaged in the deepest moral struggles. Most of Chiro's characters are either criminals or have something to hide, or both, and yet they're are almost no villains in his books. The only villain one sometimes feels is the law itself, because in a Scott Chiro novel, the law is like a chess game in which the good guy never quite wins, sometimes draws. I urge you all to read Personal Injuries, and if you want to buy it at the break, but you can also see it in the cinema, because it's going to be a film starring Dustin Hoffman. Now, you can see what attracted Hoffman to the main character in the novel, Robbie Favor, one of the most baroque, brilliantly spoken, all good, all bad characters I can think of in modern literature. And I just want to leave you with this sample of Favor's monologues. I won't try and render it in a proper Kindle County accent, but this is a section where Robbie Favor's explaining why he bribed a judge in a personal injury case. That's Morty, nervous as spaghetti. The guy fainted dead away the first time he went to court, which puts the load on Robbie. But you tell me, what was I supposed to do? And don't quote the sayings of Confucius. Tell me real world. Was I supposed to walk away from a fee of $490-some thousand dollars and just go home and start packing? Was I supposed to tell this family that's got this gawked out kid, sorry for these false hopes, that million bucks we said you got, we must have been on LSD? How many hours do you think it would be before they got themselves a lawyer whose word they could trust? You think I should have called the FBI right then? What's that mean for Morty's uncle? And what about us? In this town, nobody likes a beaver. So, Morty or not, there's only one answer. And it's like tipping in Europe. How much is enough? And where do you get it? It's comical, really. Where's that college course in bribery when you really need it? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce Scott Chiro, who will tell you much more. Well, thank you, Simon. Um, I am, I, I must say that a certain modesty requires me to acknowledge other writers with Harvard Law School educations, uh, including the poet Archibald McLeish uh, and a much honored American novelist named John Casey, the author of um, uh, An American Romance in Spartina, both uh, winners of uh, National Literary Awards. So, uh, I, I am not alone, although obviously the main production out of Harvard Law School is not novelists, although the, uh, the so-called uh, legal thriller um, actually has produced such uh, high hopes among law students that um, there, there is a seminar taught at the University of Chicago Law School, a much esteemed law school in the United States, uh, every year on uh, fiction writing and I have uh, I've been I've made guest appearances there as I am obviously making here um, I want to thank uh, both the John Adams Institute and uh, my wonderful uh, Dutch publishers uh, for inviting me here uh, it's been 32 years since I was last in Amsterdam uh, and it remains as uh, extraordinary and charming a place um, in reality, as it's long been in my memory, 
so I'm I'm pleased to be back here, and uh, it, this is uh, my my partners. Of course, are always shocked. They say, "Where are you going now?" And I, uh, this is actually the the second stop, and uh, but it's one of uh, three trips that I'm going to make to Europe this year in connection with the publication in various countries uh, of personal injuries and. Uh, you know, book touring has become uh, a sort of fatal part uh, of every author's life, although I've always vowed that I will not complain about it. Um, my theory being that the only authors I know who complain uh, more about the tours on which their publishers send them are the authors whose publishers don't send them. So, and, and the fact of the matter is, uh, there are many interesting aspects uh, to doing this. Obviously, you get to go to places like Rome, where I was uh, this morning, uh, or Amsterdam, where I am this evening. Um, and uh, even in the United States, uh, there, there are occasionally interesting moments. Um, the, uh, one of my book tour experiences uh, took me to the city of Lexington, Kentucky, where uh, my very kind hosts were eager to see that I uh, saw all the local attractions. And so they took me out uh, to see Seattle Slough. And uh, Seattle Slough, uh, as I'm sure most of you are not aware, um, is a racehorse. Um, and uh, he was a winner of the so-called American Triple Crown. And uh, Seattle Slough uh, is, a, is out to stud now. And I have to admit that seeing uh, the life of a Triple Crown winner um, who is out to stud made me think seriously for the first time in my life about reincarnation. Um, <laughs> just how bad do I have to be to come back as that horse? Um, the, uh, th this year's highlight was I sang with a, uh, a rock band made up of... Uh, prominent American writers. Uh, the, the American humorist Dave Barry has uh, long been the leader of a band called the Rock Bottom Remainders. And uh, among the remainder members are Amy Tan, the author of the Joy Luck Club, and uh, Mitch Album, a writer of a book that's quite popular in the United States right now called Tuesdays with Maury, um, and uh, a, num a number of others. I think the most prominent uh, member of all of the Rock Bottom Remainders is uh, Stephen King, uh, and uh, Stephen was uh, Stephen had a very serious accident this year. He was not playing when I did my bit with the Remainders, but the, some of the band members did confide did, did confide to me that uh, uh, Stephen is. Uh, some of these people are really excellent mu musicians. Mitch Album started his life as a professional, his adult life as a professional musician. Amy Tan uh, is a classically trained pianist. Uh, Stephen apparently uh, is not, and uh, they, they confided to me that very often they actually turn off his amp, and he doesn't know the difference, which <coughs> quite clearly I'm sure they intend to do with my microphone as well when I sing. Um, what I think remains in, in memory, my favorite um, sort of book touring event, um, took place I, back in 1993. Now, I am a baseball fan, uh, and I am from Chicago, uh, and I don't know how many of you uh, have the occasion to follow American baseball, but uh, I am a fan of a team called the Chicago Cubs, uh, who literally uh, have not uh, won the world championship in baseball uh, in living memory. Uh, my, my father, uh, whose memory I honor by being a Cub fan, literally lived a, a long life of 80 years uh, without ever seeing the Cubs win this championship. But uh, having sort of inherited this illness, of rooting for this baseball team. I was thrilled when uh, I was invited uh, in connection with the publication of my third novel, uh, Pleading Guilty, to throw out the first pitch um, at a Chicago Cub baseball game. And this is a, a ceremonial toss. Um, 
but it's uh, it's a uh, you know it's something that happens before every game. Last year, the Cubs uh, shocked everyone by making it to the playoffs, uh, the first step toward the World Championship. It was, of course, as usual, their last. But uh, the uh, the uh, person who threw out the ceremonial first pitch uh, last year for this playoff game. Uh, was none other than Michael Jordan. And uh, after Jordan had done this, uh, he threw to Sammy Sosa, the famous home run hitter who's uh, behind home plate. After he had done this, my phone started ringing off the hook because uh, many of my friends thought they had now seen the equivalent of of pigs flying. Uh, Jordan, who had been a, a former professional baseball player, if somewhat briefly, uh, threw the ball about 10 feet over Sammy Sosa's head. Uh, I, on the other hand, had thrown a strike uh, when I stood uh, on the pitcher's mound at Wrigley Field. And uh, this, of course, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. Everybody who, there watching who knew me knew it was a miracle. And I was somewhat dazed, and I staggered uh, toward home plate. Um, and at that moment, one of the security guards stopped me, and uh, he told me that uh, a, a well-known baseball player, a man named Bobby Bonilla, uh, wanted to see me. And uh, Bonilla um, was a, a star for many years, and uh, he's still playing. Uh, but at his peak, he was a great uh, star. Um, and, but he had a terrible reputation because he refused uh, to talk to reporters. And so in the press, he was portrayed as a kind of thug. And he was a huge man. And as I see him come running in from right field, I begin trying to figure out what, what have I said about uh, Puerto Rican people um, or right fielders um, or the New York Mets, which was the team he was playing with, uh, that might have caused him to be rushing toward me. And lo and behold, he gets to home plate. And uh, by now, home plate is surrounded uh, by a number of reporters whom my publishers have organized to come out and watch the event of me throwing out this first pitch. Um, there are many reporters now ringing uh, home plate to watch this confrontation between the right fielder and the writer. And lo and behold, Bonilla says to me, he says, I just bought your new book today and uh, would you mind signing it for me? <laughs> says, I'm going to ask the clubhouse man to go run into the clubhouse and get my book. And I, of course, say, well, I'd be thrilled to do it for him. And at this point, I realize that uh, I have made the biggest mistake of my life uh, because, as I say, there are at least a dozen, maybe two dozen reporters who are standing there, and it suddenly becomes... Clear, it's just as clear as if I'd had a vision what is going to happen. The clubhouse man is going to go into the clubhouse. He is going to grab the bag in Bonilla's locker where this new book uh, is resting. He's going to come running back out to home plate. He's going to hand Bonilla this bag. And out of this bag, Bonilla is going to withdraw John Grisham's new novel. <laughs> But it was my book, which is why I say it uh, was probably my favorite uh, book tour event because of my extraordinary relief. And I uh, also recognized at that moment that the uh, portrait of Mr. Bonilla that had been painted by reporters around uh, America was a false one and that he was a person of high intelligence and discerning <laughs> literary judgment. Well, I, I uh, in sort of sidling up to the subject of personal injuries and, uh, and my career, um, I, I always say, I am always at pains to say that I would not be standing here uh, but for a quintessential moment uh, in my life. And uh, when I talk about personal injuries, this has two different meanings. Um, in the winter of 1986, um, I was a prosecutor, a federal prosecutor in the United States. You know, we have two different 
court systems. There's a state court system in each of the 50 states. Each of the 50 states has its own court, and then there are courts of the United States, uh, and these are courts of equal authority. Uh, I was in the federal system, the United States system, prosecuting federal crimes, and at that time in 1986, I was involved in uh, what was probably the most uh, momentous case that I handled as a prosecutor. Uh, I was trying a sitting judge uh, in the uh, circuit court of Cook County. Uh, actually, he had been uh, his party's candidate for uh, the Supreme Court of Illinois a couple of years before, and he was a very, very powerful judge. And uh, his trial was part of a large um, effort at combating judicial corruption in Chicago, uh, which had gone on uh, for four or five years at that point. And the uh, code name for this um, operation was Operation Greylord. This was a, a federal investigation that involved both uh, historical cases, meaning finding witnesses to testify about payoffs to judges. Not such an easy thing to do, uh, let me tell you. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, a lot of undercover operatives, uh, FBI agents uh, who pretended to be corrupt lawyers uh, in the hopes of uh, finding judges to bribe. And uh, this was uh, a kind of, uh, it was a high watermark for me um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I, had, uh, I had begun... Um, I'd come to the U.S. Attorney's Office with a clear memory uh, of a story that my grandfather had told me. And uh, it is indeed a story that appears in personal injuries, although in a, a moment of, uh, of self-parody, uh, I put this story in the mouth of the prosecutor in personal injuries, who is uh, sometimes a very nasty guy. Um, but the story he tells is, in fact, uh, my story and my grandfather when I was 13 years old uh, had sat with me while I suffered the measles uh, and in those days uh, it was believed that uh, exposure to light while you had uh, the fever portion of the measles could lead to blindness and so uh, I sat in the dark and my grandfather a wonderful raconteur uh, told me the story of uh, his life literally beginning with his uh, emigration from uh, Russia at the age of 14 to the United States. And uh, one of the things that had happened to him was that he had been swindled uh, when he was about the age of 40. He had taken all of his savings, his, uh, and he was a working man all his life. He was uh, delivered milk for a local dairy, uh, along with a number of other similar jobs. Um, and uh, he took every nickel he had to buy a gas station a service station where they pump petrol uh, in downtown Chicago, only to find, uh, after he'd owned the station for a day or two, that in point of fact uh, it had been condemned by the city, uh, meaning that the city was going to take over the property and knock the service station down. And uh, I said to him when he told me this story, uh, Grandpa, um, why didn't you go to court and sue. And uh, he laughed. He had a very thick uh, Russian accent. He says, he says, a poor man like me? He says, I can't afford to buy a judge. And uh, that, was, that was the reality of life in Chicago, uh, that the corruption in the courts was so well known and deeply ingrained that... Um, you, that even an ordinary citizen knew uh, that the only way to win in court, especially against somebody who was influential enough to know the city's plans to condemn a property, uh, was to be able to bribe the judge. And so this particular case that I was trying in the winter of 1986 uh, was very important to me personally, and it was very important to my office. Um, many of the uh, young prosecutors, men and women, uh, really were putting their careers on the line with this group of cases. Uh, Machiavelli 
really summed it up in a notch, nutshell, another line that um, I, I put in the novel. But, uh, you know, if you shoot at the king, you better kill the king. Uh, and it surely was not the way to begin a promising career outside the United States Attorney's Office. And in, in the U.S., uh, particularly in those years, it was customary for someone who has worked as a public prosecutor to eventually leave government employment and go into private practice. And as I say, it would not be a promising way to start by then going out and appearing in front of judges whom you had investigated and or prosecuted. So it was important that we win these cases. Uh, and and the, as the trials began, we actually got off to a faltering start. And this particular case, uh, although not made by the undercover method, uh, there were no tape recordings or wires, uh, as we like to put the phrase. Um, this was a, uh, instead a case that uh, involved witnesses. I had put pressure on a number of people because this judge's uh, modus operandi was to um, look out into his courtroom and select one of the parties or the lawyers who was about to go to trial in front of him. And he would call uh, these people um, after court was over and ask them to come visit him in his chambers. And at that point, he would say, you know, I know I don't know you that well, but looking at you across the courtroom, I really had a feeling of personal friendship with you. And, um, and I, just, I just felt that I could confide something to you, which is that um, I... Um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it, but I, I'm in financial distress, uh, and I need to borrow some money. Would you lend me some money? Uh, well, the list of lawyers who had capitulated to this uh, included many of the best-known lawyers in the city of Chicago, including the sitting president of the State Bar Association, uh, the lawyers group, uh, sort of the number one lawyer in the state. And uh, because of this, there was tremendous public attention to this case as these prominent lawyers got up on the witness stand. Uh, and as I said, um, there was a great premium on winning the case. And um, I began to feel a lot of stress and anxiety. And I stopped sleeping at night. And uh, finally, one day, early in February of 1986, 14 years ago, uh, almost exactly, uh, my wife, Annette, picked herself up on an elbow and spoke to me the words that I believe uh, are familiar to the husbands and wives of lawyers across the United States. Namely, I want you to quit that goddamn job. Uh, and... What Annette had in mind is that I would uh, immediately leave the United States Attorney's Office and uh, finish the novel that I had been writing, as Simon mentions, on the morning commuter train uh, for, at that point, uh, seven years. And uh, I basically took her up on it. And uh, I did, in fact, leave the U.S. Attorney's Office. I arranged for another job before I did that, but I took a summer away from the law and uh, finished the novel uh, that is now known as Presumed Innocent. I have to admit, at that time, it had the title of Trespass with Force and Arms, uh, which is an obscure term from the English common law many centuries ago, and all of the editors who uh, read Presumed Innocent when it was submitted to them all said the same thing. Pretty good book, really bad title. Um, but the, uh, the road that had sort of led me to that uh, moment uh, that would prove to be both critical and, uh, by my own terms, triumphant, uh, was not really one of sort of instant success. Uh, I had uh, announced to myself my ambition to be a novelist when I was still in high school. And uh, I had gone off to uh, college at Amherst College in Massachusetts, and a uh, small, little tiny small men's school. And 
uh, there I tried to uh, find someone who could teach me how to be a novelist. And uh, right now in the United States, uh, there really is an entire generation uh, of writers who have been educated in so-called creative writing courses. But uh, at that point, uh, creative writing courses were still something being debated, uh, and the faculty at Amherst College, uh, which had a very sort of strict kind of uh, literary sense, did not believe in creative writing. So uh, instead of that, I had to take um, standard English classes, and uh, the head of the English department uh, was a man named Theodore Baird. Uh, he died only recently. Uh, and Baird is best known to uh, literary posterity uh, as Robert Frost's best friend. Frost also was on the faculty at Amherst College. And uh, this, of course, comes as some surprise uh, to many people who know about Frost's life because uh, he was a terrible kind of curmudgeon. Uh, and I think most people who know anything about Frost assume he had no friends at all. Uh, but he did have this one friend, Baird, uh, who uh, was uh, every bit as curm curmudgeonly uh, and uh, ornery as Frost himself. And uh, Baird believed in something that was called the new criticism, which meant that you evaluate literature only by looking at the words on the page. Uh, and you do not, uh, you do not uh, need to know the biography of the author or the poet. You do not need to know about the historical setting. Uh, you know, the author, the poet, could have been raised in a cage while the A-bomb went off outside the window. Um, that would not be of consequence. All you want to study are the words on the page. And to sort of bring home to students the preciousness of words, Baird would uh, come into his freshman English class uh, and he would walk up uh, to the first young man, he would have a, he'd actually have a pencil uh, in his hand, and he would say to the young man, what is it? And uh, the young man would say, a pencil, and Baird would then hit him with it. And he would then walk up to the second young man and say, what is it? And the second young man would say, it's a long, thin, yellow object. Whack. And he'd go around the classroom and uh, asking for, you know, asking his question, what is it, uh, getting all kinds of descriptions and whacking each student with it. And then he would come to the front of the room again and say, it's a weapon. He would then go to the window and he would look at the first young man he'd hit and he would point to the window and say, what is it? And the student, of course, would cringe and say, it's a window. And Baird uh, would answer, no, it's an exit. And he would then lift the window, step through it, and be gone for the remainder of the first class period. <laughs> well, I, I, I really did learn over the years a great deal from Theodore Baird, but I did not think watching that routine that it was going to make me a novelist. Um, and so I finally, uh, that summer after my freshman year in college, hit upon, uh, out of desperation, uh, what I've subsequently learned to be the only answer, which is to say, I sat down and started writing a novel. Uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is that writers write, and anybody who does is entitled to call her or himself a writer, uh, and uh, people who don't are not. Um, and uh, it's, it's just that simple. Now, the novel I wrote, um, I called Dithyramb, which is a Greek term, um, the meaning of which I no longer clearly recall. But all I know is it really didn't have a darn thing to do with the book I wrote, which was about a, uh, two young men 
uh, from uh, Chicago who run away like uh, Huck and Jim and go down the Mississippi uh, and they go to the city of New Orleans where they experience the uh, bad ways of the Old South when they witness the murder of a black prostitute. Now, when I summarize Dithyramb uh, that way, it does not sound to me like a terrible idea for a novel. But as I say, most of the novel was set in the American city of New Orleans, and I had never been to New Orleans. And so uh, the book, as a result, was somewhat lacking in atmosphere. This did not keep me from sending it out to numerous American publishers. It certainly did not keep them from sending it right back. Um, and I finally stopped sending it out when I actually got, rather than a form rejection letter, uh, a personally typed note from the editor-in-chief of what I regarded as America's most esteemed little literary publishing house, Ferrer, Strauss, and Giroux. And uh, this was a man named Michael de Capua who told me that my prose was vigorous, but uh, I ought to take this novel and put it in a desk drawer. And uh, any sign of recognition from the waiting world in New York was enough encouragement for me. Uh, and I put it in the desk drawer, but I continued to write. And uh, in point of fact, uh, by the time I was a senior in college, I had begun to start publishing my short, uh, short stories in various little magazines around the United States. Um, by that time, of course, I was taking Professor Baird's Shakespeare class now. And uh, I remember uh, the Amherst is, is a college and uh, rather than a university, and there's very little research component there. Many members of the faculty are there strictly as teachers uh, and uh, don't publish at all. So the fact that a student was publishing uh, was staggering to many members on the faculty and uh, my stories attracted some attention. And I remember Baird uh, coming up to me before one of these uh, Shakespeare classes and saying to me, I read your short story last night. It's not bad, and you're such a harmless looking little fellow. <laughs> well, with that kind of encouragement, I just had to go on. Um, and I was lucky enough to win a writing fellowship uh, to Stanford University. And uh, I spent five years at Stanford, uh, two of them as a fellow in Stanford's uh, very celebrated writing program, uh, which was then headed by uh, the great, great American novelist Wallace Stegner. And uh, eventually I started teaching there as a lecturer in the English department. And these were um, very important uh, but very difficult years for me. Um, one of the reasons, of course, was that it was the end of the 1960s. I certainly don't have to talk to people uh, in Amsterdam about the turbulence of the 1960s, uh, but uh, in, at Stanford, which is near San Francisco, there was the same kind of foment and turmoil and uh, you know, wild behavior uh, I often said of the writers around me, uh, they did not all write like Ernest Hemingway, but they surely all drank uh, like Ernest Hemingway. And I found, uh, I think the, the thing about those years that was hardest for me is that I found that writing um, was somehow incompatible uh, with some of the ambitions that I had for myself. Uh, my father was a doctor, and I think that there was a degree to which I could not really accept myself as an adult until I had taken on that kind of role as a, in a sort of helping profession. Uh, that's, that's the retrospective view um, going back to uh, more, than, more than 25 years now. But um, at, at any rate, um, I had uh, begun to become interested in the law. I found that I had many friends who were lawyers, uh, and uh, I was fascinated with the law. I would sit there and ask myself questions, you know, 
When I went into a restaurant and ordered a hamburger, and have I formed a contract when I ordered a hamburger? And uh, of course, this interest in the law had begun creeping into the fiction that I was writing. Uh, I wrote a novel while I was at Stanford called The Way Things Are, and uh, it was about a rent strike in, in Chicago, and um, my preoccupation with the law had sort of carried me away, and the, the entire plot uh, was based on uh, something in the, called in the American law the implied warranty of habitability. And, uh, this, surely, the implied warranty of habitability is not the stuff of bestsellerdom. And uh, when I uh, sent the book to American publishers by droves, uh, it suffered the same fate uh, as Dithyramb, uh, which is to say it was rejected by everybody, and the only kind response I got came again from the little literary publishing house of Ferris, Strauss, and Giroux, where this time one of the principals, Robert Giroux, wrote back to me uh, and told me about the things in the novel he admired, even while uh, he did not want to buy it. Uh, and uh, for, for that whole complex of reasons, I made this astonishing t decision that is astonishing to my friends and colleagues in the Stanford English Department, where, as I say, I had a very junior level teaching position, that I was going to go to law school. Um, and I went to law school, and uh, before I went, I <coughs> notified my literary agent. I did have an agent by then um, about what um, my intention uh, was, and I, I felt sorry for this woman um, because she had been carrying the manuscript of The Way Things Are, my novel about the rent strike, all over the city of New York, and she'd been in enduring all of these rejections. Um, and I wanted to sort of um, offer her some kind of sop. Now, the truth of the matter was that she and I never really communicated very well. And uh, the reason was that I was in California, and she was in New York, and there was a three-hour time difference. And... Uh, I, of course, was in my student days, so I was not rarely up uh, early enough on the West Coast to reach her before lunch. And she did drink a bit at lunch. And in point of fact, there was really not much communication to be had uh, after lunch. And so it was, uh, it was somewhat typical of the way things went between us that I wrote her a letter saying, I'm going to go to law school, and by the way, um, while I'm not interested in doing this, somebody should write a memoir of their law school experiences because I've discovered there aren't any books by law students that actually describe what it's like to go to law school uh, because I'd been looking for such a book while I'd been pondering my own decision. And... Um, what apparently had happened is she had one of her typical um, li liquor lubricated lunches with an editor on a rainy Friday afternoon in New York where nobody was particularly e eager to go outside. Uh, and the first bottle of wine had turned into the second bottle of wine, it turned into the third bottle of wine. And by then, she and this editor had agreed. Uh, that there was just not a decent idea for a book in the entire city of New York, at which point she remembered that she had my letter in her purse. And <clears throat> the, uh, the net result was this editor read uh, the letter uh, in his inebriate fashion at the moment, and together they decided to issue a contract to me to write this book. So after all of these rejection letters, I suddenly had a contract to write a book that I had quite clearly proposed not writing. Um, but as I say, I'd seen these rejection letters, and so I had absolutely no hesitation about signing this contract and going off to Harvard Law School uh, to make new friends and to write about them. And the, uh, of course, I got my comeuppance. Um, after I finished this book, uh, the, the editor uh, who had written this contract is a man named Ned Chase. 
and Ned had a brilliant uh, and very successful career in publishing, but he somewhat whose name is Chevy Chase, and uh, I am here to tell you that it's all genetic. Um, and after I had finished this manuscript, my phone rang, and I finished the manuscript of the book that subsequently became it's known as 1L, it's this memoir of my first year at Harvard Law School. And uh, Ned said, um, I want you to explain something to me. And so I thought he had a question about the law. Um, and I said, well, I'll answer any questions you've got about the law. No, no, it's not that's nothing, you know, it's all, you make all of these legal things very clear. Um, and I wondered if, you know, perhaps the structure was wrong. He'd asked me to look at certain books that had been written in the same kind of genre. No, no, the structure was fine. No, he said, I just want you to remind me, he said, why did I ever want to buy this book? <laughs> and I, I have to say that, uh, you know, Simon mentions that I'm often credited with having uh, invented uh, the so-called legal thriller, which is, uh, I don't have time to, to appropriately poo-poo that notion, but it's uh, needless to say, I didn't invent, um, I, I really didn't invent anything. But I did have my only moment of prescience in the sense that the only thing I could think of to tell Ned was to predict a tremendous upsurge in American interest in the law. And that was why he had bought this book. Uh, and I got a bunch of statistics, and it turned out that I was on to something. Applications to American law schools had quadrupled uh, in the last four years. And I predicted that there would therefore be a market, and I was right. The book is, is still in print today. But uh, the book was published in uh, 1977. Uh, and as first books go, it was really, uh, I think, uh, a significant uh, success. Um, but I was still a law student at the time that I published this book. Uh, and as I say, it was a memoir. It was nonfiction. I changed the names of characters, as it were, to protect the guilty. Uh, but um, certainly, uh, everybody knew who they were in the book. And uh, people who uh, thought they were favorably portrayed in the book uh, regarded it as a sensitive, uh, discerning uh, literary work. People who were not favorably, as favorably portrayed had other opinions. And uh, the kind of bad guy of uh, 1L was one of my professors whom I referred to as Rudolf Perini, who was portrayed as absolutely brutal in the classroom, withering to his students, would cut him to shreds in these daily Socratic debates. Um, and uh, this particular one of my professors uh, literally called a news conference as the book began to get some attention. And he wanted the assembled reporters to know that he, in fact, was the model for Perini, and he was angrier than hell about it. Now, just how much he meant that, uh, I did not realize until the end of that semester. This is now my first semester of my third year in law school. And one of my friends came running out of uh, that pr particular professor's copyright course, the exam he had given. And the first question, on the exam read something like this. Uh, you work in a large law firm. A senior partner introduces you to his valued client, Professor Rudolph Perini. Professor Perini has undergone the humiliating experience of having a student, Ray Ripoff, write a book about his daily classroom appearances. Please list all theories under which Professor Perini can sue Ray Ripoff. <laughs> so all of this becomes a prelude um, to personal injuries because uh, one of the things I had learned from that experience was I was not going to write any more autobiography. Um, there were too many Professor Perinis in the world especially uh, when I was writing about a federal investigation um, in which I had taken part. 
Um, more particularly, um, I, I don't believe in confusing autobiography and fiction. Um, I, I really, as a writer, um, have um, a profound belief um, in the power and importance of storytelling. Um, and I, I really think that uh, what has, I, I think it may be true that all art is narrative. Certainly, all literary art, in my judgment, is narrative. Um, and I think that you know, the power of narrative over the millennia um, has really derived from two elements, um, one of which autobiography does not necessarily provide. Um, the first, of course, is identification. Um, the ability of human beings um, through literature especially, through narrative, uh, to, to see the world um, not simply through others' eyes but literally um, by feeling uh, that they are inside their, the skins and minds of characters um, is a uniquely human trait. Uh, it, is, um, it is just as defining of us as human beings as you know, the opposable thumb uh, that the anthropologists always talk about. And it is clearly the foundation uh, of our moral consciousness, uh, our ability to imagine the world from the perspective of others uh, really uh, is the, the bottom uh, line concept, the fundamental concept in our entire theory of what is just. Uh, and of course, storytelling uh, exploits and enhances that ability in human beings. Um, the other thing, of course, that storytelling does that autobiography cannot necessarily do um, is to form experience and to um, offer some kind of theory uh, about why uh, experience is not uh, irrational um, and to provide some kind of uh, cause and effect, whether it's Aesop's moral of the story or the far uh, gentler and more ephemeral kinds of lessons that we learn from modern tales. Um, I you know, believe uh, very much in storytelling and so I wanted to transform my experiences as a prosecutor into stories. Um, but e even with that, uh, I think the last thing I will say before I sit down is to sort of um, reveal uh, that even though I was not trying to be autobiographical, um, I in some ways was anyway. What I thought I was doing in personal injuries was sort of writing a book uh, that took off from uh, Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory, which was, uh, in my judgment, uh, the, the best work of suspense fiction uh, that was written in the 20th century. And uh, as those of you who have uh, read The Power and the Glory remember, uh, its amazing strategy is to uh, use as its protagonist and literally its hero um, the so-called Whiskey Priest, uh, an unnamed character who is a Roman Catholic priest uh, on the run in Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, who uh, on top of uh, being a drunk, uh, is also uh, the father of a child. And, uh, and despite his shocking misbehavior, uh, the book reveals him to be a person of truly saintly character. Uh, and I'd always been you know, intrigued by that narrative strategy. And uh, Personal Injuries tells, focuses on Robbie Favor, uh, a corrupt personal injury lawyer who, as Simon mentions, has been bribing uh, judges uh, for decades uh, and reaping the profits of that. And uh, unlike the whiskey priest who, on rereading, I realized, um, while his conduct was shocking by the standards of the 30s morality in which Green wrote, 
uh, in retrospect, you could read the book and see that he was a person of saintly character by the end of the first chapter. Um, I did not want that to be the case with Robbie Favor, and uh, surely it is never, uh, the, never evident that he is a person of saintly character. Uh, his, uh, his strengths uh, are revealed only through his encounters with a female FBI agent who has been assigned to watch him. Uh, a woman named Evan Miller. And what Robbie does is he agrees to become an undercover operative for the government in a judicial corruption investigation just like um, just like the Greylord investigation in which I had been involved. Um, but as I say, what I thought I was doing was sort of molding my experiences in Greylord um, in uh, after the model of what I thought of as a, as a great, great novel and one that had enormously impressed me. Um, but after I finished, and only after I finished, uh, did I begin to contemplate uh, the deeper roots of this book. Um, during the time that Greylord operated, and as I say, it was an undercover operation, phony cases were set up, uh, which is something that happens in personal injuries, and FBI agents had all kinds of electronic surveillance going on. Again, something that happens in personal injuries. But the, the one problem that we had in that investigation is that we never could recruit a corrupt lawyer, somebody who was well known to the various judges uh, that he had been bribing, uh, and turn that person into a government informant. Um, it just it ne we never succeeded in doing that. And one of the reasons we never succeeded was because I had been assigned to do that, and I failed miserably in the task. Uh, I did find a lawyer who was vulnerable to government persuasion uh, because he'd done many, many bad things. Um, but he turned out to be the most manipulative and deceitful human being I had ever met in my life. And uh, not only had he uh, led many clients uh, astray, uh, he and, and many judges and, and police officers whom he had bribed, but he also led me astray. Uh, and uh, by the time I was done with him, uh, not only was he not working for the government as an undercover operative, but I was accused of misconduct by a court simply because I'd been involved with him. And as I look back at personal injuries, um, I see um, an effort uh, to sort of rewrite my own history, uh, to uh, create a character who was more malleable, less deceitful, more worthy, uh, and to sort of uh, finally succeed in the task that I failed at as a prosecutor, that is to, to develop an informant, a lawyer who bribes judges and does it successfully under government surveillance. So that is the long-winded story of personal injuries, uh, and uh, Simon and I will have some dialogue about it uh, after our break. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there is only a 15-minute break, just enough to stretch your legs. Uh, Scott Earl will be signing books uh, seated at the table here. And see you back in 15 minutes. Okay. I think we're almost at the point where we can start the second half, where Scott Earl will answer my questions and yours. I have here number of questions from people who are too shy or modest to ask them in person, but at some point I'm going to ask for questions from the hall, so please go to the microphone, introduce yourself um, briefly, and then ask your question. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chiro, I want to start by asking you about um, your influences, which one asks every writer, but here it's particularly important because you say you didn't invent the legal thriller. Now, not to sound like Hitchcock, but if you didn't invent the legal thriller, then who did? 
So, in other words, you mentioned Graham Greene earlier. Who else? Where does Scotch Row come from? Well, when I say I didn't invent the legal thriller, um, I'm talking about the fact that you know novels about trials, uh, certainly stories about trials, go back to the you know the, the trial of Socrates, um, you know, as written by Plato, um, and uh, you know they've 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 been a large part of our literature. Um, you know, whether we're thinking about The Merchant of Venice or Billy Budd uh, or even books in my lifetime uh, like The Anatomy of a Murder uh, or uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, I think what was different about um, Presumed Innocent uh, and what sort of changed uh, the mold a little bit were, were really two major things. Uh, one was the heightened emphasis on legal procedures, uh, stuff that uh, I'm sure uh, I often thought was going to bore readers to, te readers to tears, uh, but which I insisted on putting in the book because I had so resented uh, even as a child and even while I was enthralled by Perry Mason, I knew it couldn't be that way. And so I wanted to write a book that was true to the reality of the courtroom. Um, and the, the, in point of fact, all of the books that have sort of been spawned by presumed innocent success uh, are much more uh, technical uh, than uh, the books that came before. The other big difference is that generally speaking, if you think about To Kill a Mockingbird uh, or even Anatomy of a Murder, um, you are talking about the lawyer uh, as a sort of paragon uh, of justice. Uh, in other words, the lawyer uh, as a figure is kind of a symbol in these stories. And uh, obviously, Rusty Savage and Presumed Innocent uh, and every other, uh, and certainly Robbie Favor, is a grand inheritor of this tradition of being uh, a flawed um, and sometimes deeply flawed person. And again, uh, even in the novels uh, of, uh, let's take John Grisham, who's, you know, had the widest imaginable commercial success, even in John's books, uh, it is true that the lawyer hero uh, is inevitably uh, flawed in some way. You mentioned Grisham. I was asked by someone at the break to ask you, uh, do you have a G-spot? Are you a Grisham fan? <clears throat> I always try to dance around these questions, um, in part because the truth is uh, I, I like John a lot, personally, and he is a very worthy, very admirable person. Uh, I also have enjoyed um, you know, some of his books. Uh, I like The Partner, for example. Uh, very much, uh, but you know, the, we do, we have different ambitions as writers. Uh, you know, John uh, has a wingspan as an author uh, that I truly envy. I mean, his books can be read by junior high schoolers uh, and uh, eighty-nine-year-olds and everybody in between, and men and women, and you know, uh, he crosses just about every imaginable divide. Um, but you make certain sacrifices when you speak to an audience that large uh, and I have not been willing to make those. You talk about the lawyers you write about and what distinguishes your books is the lawyers don't just try the cases, they actually uh, are often the accused. Now, in a way when you write about lawyers you're writing about a large part of the American establishment aren't you? There's a question here, people are saying the US is run by lawyers and not by the government, in fact the government is also lawyers. What's your view? Do the lawyers run it? Oh, there's no question that lawyers run the United States to, a, to an extent uh, that they uh, did not 50 years ago and in point of fact uh, this is one of the things that drives the interest uh, in all of that legal procedure that's in these novels. Uh, people are aware of how prominent lawyers are in the society uh, and they want to understand uh, some of the arcane features 
of the profession because they recognize it has a lot of impact on their lives. And Americans are very interested in lawyers, also very interested in crimes being a big American topic. Might that diminish? Might your role as a crime writer change now that crime is disappearing in the US? Yeah, I... <laughs> We are a long way from the disappearance <laughs> of crime. And, uh, you know, crime obviously um, draws people in um, because, I think, because of um, the war that goes on uh, and is successfully won in most of us against extreme impulse. Uh, but the crime novel, which sort of acts out um, that inner drama, uh, is, uh, you know, it, it is part of the sort of under fantasy undercurrent of most lives. Well, what would happen if I really did, you know, turn around and, uh, you know, plunge a knife through the breastbone of whoever it is who's driving me crazy? Uh, this day, and you know, how would that proceed? And it's so I, I you know, I, I don't think the crime novel is about to disappear. Uh, crime is, uh, you know, still a large feature of American life, and uh, I know to a much lesser extent, but still even a feature of Dutch life. Well, it's a relief to hear that crime is still with us. Now, the lesson I draw from your novels, or one of the lessons, is that if I were to plunge a knife through somebody's breastbone, I'd probably be acquitted in court because that's a, a major theme. Did you, as a lawyer, encounter many cases, this is a question from the audience, where people were pronounced innocent when they were in fact guilty, or vice versa? Well, every case I lost as a prosecutor <laughs> certainly <laughs> fell into that category. Um, I'm, I'm being facetious, but that, of course, was my feeling, and I still believe uh, you know, was the truth. I, I tried uh, 30 cases as a prosecutor and I lost three of them and that's a, that's a pretty normal uh, ratio um, for American prosecutors. I mean, you're supposed to win uh, most of the time and, uh, you know, I, I never went to trial unless I was personally convinced beyond any doubt that the person on trial was guilty of the crime and the first, the first time somebody walked out of the courtroom um, because in this case our supposedly cooperating witness had decided not to stop cooperating about halfway through his testimony. Um, you know, when that happened it was, uh, I mean I took it as a terrible failure. I felt I had let Chicago down because I'd allowed to go back on the streets, you know, someone whom I knew to be a criminal. And I think prosecutors, you know, often feel that pressure. Uh, of course, as a defense lawyer, I've come to experience it uh, in a much different way. And, uh, you know, my wife has never gotten used to this, you know, but he did it. <laughs> but he did it, she says. And, you know, my attitude is that's not the point. <laughs> You're a great novelist. Now, all false modesty aside, are you also a great lawyer? Hmm. Well, I, you know, I don't... I have some skills as a lawyer which, uh, you know, I think have been very well refined. And uh, I was the chief of the supervisor of the appellate section in the United States Attorney's Office for four of my eight years, and uh, I've been a very successful uh, appellate lawyer, um, you know, the combination of research and writing, um, you know, suits my, and, and the oral argument uh, seem to suit my skills. Uh, you know, I, I try very few cases these days, um, and I always felt in the courtroom I was good but not great. Mm -hmm. Many of the characters in your novels and from what I understand, you as well, are terrifically driven in a way that it's very hard for Europeans to grasp. Um, Does this mean that they don't have Jewish mothers in Europe? Is that...? <laughs> Not recently, no. <laughs> Wasn't meant to be a joke. 
Is, uh, is that how you regard yourself, why you effectively have been crazy enough to uh, be a best-selling novelist and work as well? Well, they, I mean, there, there's no doubt that pursuing two careers is clearly the sign of a character defect. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, the truth of the matter is uh, when, uh, when Presumed Innocent was, uh, was sold, um, uh, there were a number of competing author, offers, and it should come as no surprise after the stories that I told that uh, I chose the little literary publishing house of Ferris, Strauss, and Giroux. And at that time, the managing director was Roger Strauss III, who is uh, the younger son of Roger Strauss Jr., who uh, is now uh, and always has been uh, the Strauss of Ferris, Strauss. And uh, when Raj came out to see me, I mean, he flew, he, he got on the phone and asked what I regarded as the funniest question I'd ever heard. My God, where have you been all these years? Uh, and he came, he came flying out to Chicago to meet me. And he said, don't give up your life. Your life is what has made you who you are. Um, he said, I've seen so many people in, in your position sort of run wild with success. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm, my wife Annette, who has grown uh, very weary of the American press and has given a single interview uh, in, in all of these years, uh, I guess maybe two, um, but it, it was to the New York Times. It was the first reporter who ever came knocking on our door. And she said to this man, Jeff Shear, when he said, well, what is it like to be successful? finally at the age of 38, and she looked at him, she said, we've always been successful. I've always felt that we were successful. Be, you know, we were, we knew what we believed in, and, and we knew what was important to us, and we led a life that, that you know, placed those values at the forefront. And, um, you know, I, I, I guess that's part of why I held on uh, to the second profession. Yeah, and I've spent many hours in the last several years. Um, I mean, there is a point in time that most litigating lawyers get to of saying, you know, is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? And, uh, you know, the answer in my case, like many others, is no. Um, you know, whatever, was, whatever I was trying to prove to myself in the courtroom, uh, I've either proved or not proved uh, to my own satisfaction, uh, but I really enjoy the law, and uh, I don't want to let go of it. Can I test you, when you're in Rome or in Amsterdam, do they fax you work? Well, they haven't this week. Um, you know, do I collect my voice messages? Yes. Uh, will there be a Federal Express package waiting for me? Yes. You know, will it have you know the briefs in it that I have to argue in court on Monday? Yes. Um, so you know, you're never far from work as a lawyer. Just the last couple of questions before we throw it open to the floor. Um, now we don't do new criticism here. We are interested in your life, and you've been kind enough to talk about it to some degree. Chicago is Chicago as bad as Kendall County? Is it anywhere near as bad as Kendall County? Well, I mean, I, I loved your description of, uh, of Kindle County as Sodom and Gomorrah with bad weather. Um, <laughs> but I don't think of Kindle County as Sodom and Gomorrah. I, I, I do uh, think of it as being pretty representative of the world in which uh, I grew up, you know, the sort of teeming, striving city uh, populated mostly with the uh, you know immigrants and their uh, and and their heirs, uh, and uh, you know where all of that social buffeting uh, has led to uh, a kind of social competition that includes a significant amount of corruption. Uh, and uh, one of the things I discuss in personal injuries uh, is uh, the fact that uh, although it's not a particularly uh, politically correct thing to say, much of the corruption in Chicago right now uh, is focused 
in the African American community where people are in their first generation of holding power uh, and very much seem to have the attitude of, you know, I want the same thing those guys got. Uh, and unfortunately uh, for them, in many cases, the technology is a lot better than it was 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, and, you know, people are getting caught. Uh, but on the whole, Chicago is not as corrupt as it was when I started my career as a prosecutor. That being said, uh, there's still enough corruption uh, to go around and to make sure that there is almost always a prominent public corruption trial taking place in the federal courthouse. Thanks very much so far. Now, if anyone wants to start us off with a question from the floor, then please do so. You see the microphones on both sides. Please. First, one short question. In that uh, Greylord case, did you get a lot of convictions? Uh, in Greylord, yes, although I lost one of those cases and it broke my heart. Absolutely broke my heart. I had an attempted bribery case. And as we discovered in Greylord, uh, people were, juries were not willing to convict prominent lawyers no matter how clear the evidence that they were going to bribe a judge or that they uh, tried to bribe a judge when we didn't have the evidence that they actually succeeded. The other question is, I was a practicing barrister in London until the mid-1960s, and I grew up reading biographies of Patrick Hastings, Marshall Hall, or Clarence Darrow. And you got the impression that good lawyers always made the case. Get the right lawyer and you win, get the wrong lawyer and you lose. When I actually had cases myself, defending things like tax fraud, I found it was the client who made the case. Um, sometimes, I, you know, I had a bunch of butchers of clients, he tied the noose around his own neck, and I said Clarence Darrow wouldn't have saved this guy. I had another client who was a Hungarian manufacturer of zip fasteners. He was brilliant in the witness box, and he said he doesn't need me. Any old hack lawyer is going to win this, and we did win. I mean, you know, this courtroom romance, once you're there, all the attorneys were bumbling and incoherent, the judges were bumbling and incoherent, and it wasn't good television, it was terrible, but it was still good law, and basically, uh, my conviction is that they got the right answer. Is this the Chicago experience, or are things a little, have they got more speed in Chicago? Well, um, first of all, I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, my experience has, as a, um, as a lawyer has been that, generally speaking, the results are right. Um, I think it was Lord Mansfield who said that, um, you know, rule wisely and never give your reasons. And uh, when you get into the reasons, especially with juries, it makes you crazy. You know, uh, they, they misunderstand, they don't have a clue, but they've somehow they end up in the right place most of the time. Um, and I also agree that lawyers, in most cases, do not change the results. Um, you know, the facts are the facts. And uh, one of the things that I learned as a prosecutor was, uh, as long as I didn't mess it up, sure. if I had the evidence, I was going to win. And it didn't matter. I was, I was arguing against much more experienced attorneys. But the fact of the matter was I had the case and they didn't. And uh, so, I, so I was going to win. I would say, though, that the, what I do disagree with is that, for me, the courtroom has always been a place of intense drama. Uh, while I was a supervisor in the United States Attorney's Office, I used to go up to watch the younger attorneys uh, as they were on trial. And inevitably, it consumed my entire afternoon because I'd get up there and I'd go knowing that the critical moment in the case was coming and I wanted to see how they were handling it. And the witness would start talking and my jaw would drop and I, would just, I was just drawn in. The story, especially in criminal cases, of how evil happens in our midst uh, just always has seduced me. 
Other question, please. Yes, this gentleman at the front. You told us, uh, sorry, my name is Peter Sagar. Um, you told us about how you felt when a criminal walked out in case you were a prosecutor. Uh, after that, you were defending people. How did you feel, if you ever did, defending people who you probably had a lynching feel that they were guilty and were acquitted? Well, I, I, that's not the hard one um, because I don't, in the, um, in the American justice system is truly based on a fundamental liberal vision in a Lockean sense, and the, you know, as John Locke would have described it. It really sees the individual as uh, a, the sort of ultimate irreducible particle in the state, and uh, therefore in a criminal trial, before the state may deprive that uh, person of uh, his or her liberty, uh, the, the state must prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The individual on trial has no obligation whatsoever to assist uh, the state in proving uh, his or her guilt. And so my job is to put the state to its proof. The harder thing for me uh, has not been seeing the uh, innocent, uh, the guilty walk away. Um, I vowed when I became a defense lawyer that I was never going to allow an innocent client to plead guilty. And that vow did not last very long. Uh, you know, when a client had a choice between probation and a compulsory six years in prison, uh, the client chose the probation. Now, I understood it, but it involved the client standing. I mean, I wasn't certain this man was innocent, but I thought there was a very good, very good chance he was innocent, and a, certainly a very strong chance he would have been acquitted at trial. But how could I tell him to risk six years in the penitentiary just to, to vindicate my sense of justice? And I knew the prosecutors were offering him a way out of this mandatory minimum sentence because they knew they had a strong chance of losing. He, and it was his choice and he made it. Um, it bothered me, but it was his choice. Another question, please. Gentleman there. Hi, uh, my name is Elio de la Valliere. I'm from Argentina. Um, I would like to concentrate more on the literary, on your literary hat, uh, although it does uh, involve law. I was thinking more of uh, what were your influences uh, as you were writing, and more important, as you were writing, did you begin to appreciate uh, other authors? And specifically, when we speak about crime novels, let's not forget that, for example, a very famous book, L'Etranger, by Albert Camus, is not only a crime novel, but it's also a legal novel. 80% of the novel does occur in the, in the court of law. We have uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment that is sometimes called the ultimate crime novel. Uh, has your view of these, uh, of these works of art changed as you're uh, becoming more and more adept at what you're doing? Because I'm sure that to us, your work is great, but the way you analyze your work, you can probably continuously see better ways of doing it and so forth. Are you, are you still influenced by, because Milan Kundera, for example, still maintains that he's influenced every day by, uh, by authors. Uh, uh, and just was wondering how, how you feel about that. Well, I, I am influenced every day by, uh, by authors, by the entire world of literature. Uh, as a younger person, uh, there were, Saul Bellow, because he was a Chicagoan and a Jew, uh, was immensely important to me. He sort of gave me an intellectual window on my parents' world. Um, and I mentioned Graham Greene and uh, Le Carre, who both, to me, proved that uh, these themes that fascinated me could be written about um, in what I regarded as a very refined way. Um, but, you know, the fact of the matter is that uh, 
my influences not, not only include the great names of literature, uh, but you know, virtually every book I read, you know, there's any book I like, um, usually causes me to um, feel some real wonder at what the author has accomplished and as uh, we used to put it forthrightly at, uh, at Stanford uh, and also it kindles the desire to steal uh, from, from that author. In terms of my perspectives on the great works of literature, um, I think it changes not because of my uh, craft uh, but because of my age. Uh, and I'm not sure that, uh, you know, a, a sentimental education uh, would have uh, meant very much to me uh, when I was 20. But, uh, you know, when I was uh, 45 and read it, uh, you know, and sat there and said to myself, when is this guy going to realize what a jerk he is? And, and suddenly thought, as soon as I asked the question, Never, and that's the point of the book. Um, I, I, that would not have meant anywhere near as much to me uh, as a young person. There was a question from someone in the middle. This lady. Well, my, my adventures in Hollywood um, have literally been never-ending since, uh, since 1987 when the film rights to Presumed Innocent were purchased. And uh, every one of the novels, and even 1L, um, have been you know, purchased uh, since then. And uh, you know, the, the Burden of Proof, my second novel, was filmed for American television. Uh, and still shows up on the cable stations in the U.S. on a fairly regular basis. Um, and, uh, you know, nothing since then has made it all the way to production. Uh, I have, uh, I find the Hollywood business world revolting. Uh, I find the Hollywood creative world uh, very engaging. Um, and, uh, yes, I have been consulted. Uh, I will not write the screenplays because uh, I regard that uh, there are two things about it that I really don't find appetizing. One uh, is that I have to perform surgery on myself. Every screenplay requires you know, shortening the story, getting rid of characters, taking shortcuts, uh, and I wouldn't want to do it. Even beyond that, I do not want to take orders from a producer or a studio head or a star about a world that I created. I respect their rights to take it and make it their own. It is a separate work uh, and it is theirs, but I do not need to be um, as, I do not need to be the sort of amanuensis of, uh, of somebody else's creativity. I had my chance it's mine. I still regard myself as the proprietor of that imaginary world, and I, I don't want to lose that proprietorship to somebody else. So, um, you know, I do. Do I like talking to Dustin Hoffman on a regular basis? Of course I do. <laughs> of course I do. He's an incredibly witty, intense, uh, intelligent uh, person, and he's been unbelievably kind to me. Uh, and, you know, insists in involving me in every decision. Um, but, you know, that it's his right not to do that. And, uh, you know, he will give me no offense um, at the moment that, you know, that kind of regular communication for one reason or another has to cease. I just want to come back to something you said just now. You were talking about learning as a novelist. Can you point to something that over the 13 years of your career as a novelist that you've learned something specific? Well, I, I mean, I, I am constantly battling my own tendency, both as a lawyer and as a writer, to overcomplicate things. And uh, at least in terms of my prose, uh, 
you know, I have learned to sort of pull back a little bit, to overwrite uh, a little less often, uh, and uh, you know, to accept the fact that uh, you know the, the the reader's heart is not one in a. This sort of comparison of of novels is a little like, matter of fact, very much like comparisons of children. Um, I adore them all. Um, and uh, there are things in Presumed Innocent I will never have again uh, the kind of incandescent passion uh, that drove me while I wrote that book. Um, I was on fire during that summer that I had away from the law uh, with this story. And, uh, and of course, because it was the first time that I managed to make those two halves of my life fit together. And the passion was literally sort of making myself whole. Uh, and I, you can't step in the same stream twice. Uh, are there things in Presumed Innocent I regret? Yes, there are. There are things I regret in every one of the books. Uh, and I always enjoy uh, the phrase that an author's favorite book is the one that she or he is working on now. Um, <laughs> Another question from the floor, please. I have also allowed, so I'll stay back here. If you want. You talked earlier about storytelling and narrative being something that makes us human or is part of our humanity. Uh, one can also say that storytelling and narrative are usually used to teach a moral of some sort or some kind of morality. Is there any particular morality that you're trying to impart to us, your readers? Well, you know, I don't. I don't believe in the sort of uh, ESOP uh, one-liner, um, but I, I do think that you know I have my own philosophy. Uh, it probably was most clearly expressed at the end of *The Burden of Proof*, where Sandy Stern stands uh, and prays over the body of uh, someone with, to whom he is very close. And uh, in his prayer, he says that uh, he asks God to accept the soul of this person and says that you know, he did better than some and worse than, uh, worse than many others in you know, what is our fundamental struggle, which is to uh, be possessed by uh, unseemly impulse, lust, greed, vanity, um, but that uh, and it is our constant duty to resist uh, those impulses and our great glory uh, that we often succeed. I think we have time for one more question from the floor, so who's going to ask it? There, there's a hand in the middle. I think a lot of Americans feel that there is something wrong with American law now. Can you tell us something about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that Ameri Americans think that there's a lot wrong with American law. Um, and uh, I think their objections come down to um, a, a few fundamental things. One, they think that lawyers make way too much money. Uh, in point of fact, lawyers moved more uniformly out of the middle class into the upper class than any other group in American society last century. Uh, and there's a good reason that people think that they make too much money and are driven too much by money, because they are. Um, and uh, what has happened to the profession in the 20-some uh, years that I have been practicing is simply revolting. Uh, people are, there's not even any pretense anymore. People are openly greedy. In, in the practice of law in the United States. And it's a shame. It's a shame because 
it deprives people of the only satisfaction that that profession offers because there's tremendous stress, uh, horrible competition, uh, and the only thing that can really redeem uh, some of the terrible ground rules uh, is having a sense that the reason you are there is because you are a participant in this evolving system of justice. That, that's all that will end up justifying that life in the end. Um, so that perception of American lawyers by the American public is correct. Um, they also do not like advocacy. Um, they do not like the habit of lawyers of torturing the truth uh, for their client's benefit. And that, unfortunately, is something that is built into the system, the way it's practiced in the United States. And it seems disingenuous uh, and false until the lawyer who's doing it is your lawyer. Uh, and then what's coming out of his or her mouth is, in point of fact, exactly the way you saw that situation. Nobody else may see it that way, but that's how you saw it. Um, and so in, to that extent, I think that they um, are, I mean, I have, my, I have real questions about the adversary system, but that's the system we've got in the United States. The, to the extent that they blame lawyers for a systemic problem, I think it's unfair. The other reason that people don't like lawyers uh, is probably the most unfair of all, and that is because they don't like the answers that the law comes up with to certain kinds of problems. Uh, should abortion be legal? Should surrogate motherhood be legal? Should gay people be allowed to receive the sanction for their union from the state through marriage? Uh, a lot of people don't like the way the law answers these questions. And a lot of these questions get, answers, get answered in courts of law. And, um, you know, the fact of the, the law is very bad at acknowledging ambiguity. It declares rules in enormously difficult situations. I mean, it's a paradox that a, something like the Supreme Court will rule five to four in a case, and that, that's the rule of law, even though nearly half of the justices who sat on that body thought that rule was wrong. And, uh, you know, because the law doesn't sort of uh, stick a toe in the earth and go, aw, shucks, uh, or say, you know, this is really a hard case, and uh, I don't know if this is the right thing, but we got to have a rule, so this is the rule. Uh, but yeah, you know, your objections, those are really smart objections. And, uh, you know, that's why this rule isn't going to work all the time. The law can't do that. And, uh, you know, people don't realize that institutional necessity is there, and it makes them angry. My uh, friend, uh, Joseph Toro, who's a district court judge, a federal judge in Massachusetts, likes to, likes to say, one of the things that's terrible about this job is that on the best day, half the people leave my courtroom unhappy. Well, Scott Shearer has been a fantastic speaker, speaks as well as he writes, which is the highest compliment. Before Anna starts her closing remarks, I think one last question. You're a man of so many parts. What's going to be your epitaph? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I used to say there is no such thing as a free lunch, uh, but like various literary works, um, that's one that probably I don't want there anymore. Uh, how about he tried? Thank you, Scott Turow and uh, Simon Cooper. You were wonderful and 
very informative and even very entertaining, and I'm sure we all leave very happy this room. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated until Scott Turo has uh, left the room to go sign a couple of more books. Um, I would uh, like to tell you that on 24 February, Rick Moody is speaking in a program, and he will talk to Hans Maarten van der Brink. He is one of his favorite authors. And um, after that, in March, uh, Paul Theroux is coming. So please um, get some information in the hall. Uh, the updates of a spring program will be there. Um, please remain seated, and we will leave the room. Thank you for having been here, and come again. <laughs> <laughs>